Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Giovanni Mauro. Uh, I'm a PhD student of the National PhD uh, in AI, Italian National PhD in AI. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Renault and Bios for hosting me here in Oxford and Tim and Nicole for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, it is a great, uh, great occasion for me for sharing my work with you guys and hear your opinion and hear your critics, of course. Too. So let's start. Let's start. Okay. So. Uh, this should be the moment where I introduce myself and I explain you some boring stuff about human mobility analysis. Uh, but I wanted to keep it different, let's say. So this is the example, the example of my trajectory. I was born in Catanzaro, as we already know, the capital of Southern Italy in 1995. Then I moved to Pisa for completing my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at the University of Pisa. After that, I moved in Barcelona for my master's degree in data science at Università Politecnica di Catalunya Barcelona Tech. And after that, I moved again, guess what, to Pisa uh, for starting a said, national doctorate in AI. I must say this is a bit of a lie because this is a trajectory with a top detection period of two years because in the meantime, I also stayed in Madrid, stayed in a lot of other different places, but as you can see, this trajectory is pretty hard to visualize. Imagine that in a note over there, so it is what we scientists do, that is cherry picking, you know? So <laughs> I said to my exactly the top detection period for two years, so that we are all happy. So let's start with the first claim. My first claim is that cities are complex systems. So the first thing that one can uh, can answer is, do we trust this kind of entities, the cities? If we trust them well, all sets, we don't have to do anything the system will regulate automatically to what the social group, and there is no need to study them. No, if we think that we don't trust them, uh, these systems will show some strong inequalities. As you may know, this is my point. Uh, in fact, uh, cities show a lot of inequalities, for example, think about traffic, pollution, epidemics that show the peace in the city, as we know, and also of inequality. For example, also inequality, socioeconomic inequality, and social inequality. If there are complex systems, uh, we need to model them. How can we model them? Well, we can have a more classical approach, let's say, using agent-based models, or a more mm, recent approach uh, using artificial intelligence models. During my path, as we will see, I try to, I'm trying to put to both of them. What are the pros of agent-based modeling or classical modeling? Well, you can have a detailed representation of what's going on. It's a tool that is explainable by design because you set the rules of the agents and can use, can use that word if I to. Of course, there are some cons. You are cured by dimensionality. You can't use too many parameters or the situation is going to, uh, to become unpredictable and uncontrollable uh, you uh, you can do prediction with the base model or you can but the performance are really cool and it's a full simulated scenario on the other hand by you some of these artificial intelligence models you have accurate algorithms that can exploit latent knowledge in the big data so you are be you are being completely with data driven but you will have some prob some problems in interpreting what's going on to control what it, what's going on and your only aim can be the performance. Okay, what am I doing for dealing with it? I'm wearing the shoes of my human mobility analyst. That is the role in which I started my research activity. Uh, for studying the simulate the, the complex mechanism that rules the immense laboratory of trial and error that are defeated, as Jane Jacobs in her seminal works, uh, that's a life of great American physics defined in the I will have a special flow, a special focus on flow analysis, segregation, and identification phenomena. So here is another example of trajectory. It is the trajectory of my studies that are about flows. 
uh, I started with the AI for flow generation. I continued with, with emissions, but the emissions of the flow, understanding how the segregation flows work and if they show some inequality. I must say that this was a journey, a walking and counting journey, uh, because I didn't understand what was my, my point and my aim. Uh, I must say that right now I'm more focused in these two last guys there, but nevertheless, these two other guys were important for making me understand where, where I was going on. So let's start with the first word. Uh, we saw an example of trajectory. We can, everybody, I mean, all of us know what is a flow. It's an aggregation of trajectories. So, analyzing the problem of mobility, counting how many people or how many objects, if you count, for example, cars, move from a place to another. It can be a tessellation, it can be whatever representation of a space. Uh, one, there are some open problems in the flow. Uh, human mobility area study. There is a flow prediction. If you predict, trying to predict how many people will move between two zones, the crowd flow prediction that is more uh, uh, trying to predict how crowded will be an area in terms of outflow or inflow. And there is the flow generation, generating some mixing flows, for example. The problem is that the classic flow generation problem is to extend some observed flows. For example, I observe a network with some links, I miss some links, and I run some, some algorithms for uh, generating this link. For example, this is done with the gravity or radiation model that, in, uh, in uh, fully speaking, learn some exponents and then understand how to build new edges or from a deep learning perspective with some graphical network that learns some node or edge embeddings or some classical fully connected network does. Uh, we came up with a different solution that is more than generating mobility networks with guns generated by their fellow networks. First thing first, what is a mobility network? A mobility network is a weighted and directed network in which the nodes are the tiles or not partial tessellation. A tessellation is a division and an overlapping division of a space, and the edges are the flow of people moving between these nodes of the network, of, so of these tiles. Uh, so it's an adjacency matrix. Basically, it's not symmetric because one can, a different number of people can move between uh, two places depending on the direction. And we reformulate the problem of flow generation in a slightly different way. We want to generate the world mobility network. How? Well, observing previous or known mobility networks. So we observe a training network, a training set, and we generate a synthetic uh, example. It is an harder task because, of course, you don't have a ground truth. You can have a ground truth when doing a flow generation because you know you, you can save some space. For thing if the net the edges that you are generating are somehow good, you can do it that because you are generating a, a new gun in the city. So we came up with guns. What are guns are AI that fight. So uh, our main is built up of two blocks, a generator and a discriminator. Basically, the, the uh, generator learns how to um, reproduce the training set of sample drawn from a state distribution and the discriminator learns how to discriminate which sample are generated by the generator and which are real ones. Of course there is a common loss that updates both discriminator and generate and generator. Of course with this iteratively uh, long process you can build two networks one that is completely full because it's not able anymore to understand if a sample is fake or if it is real. And the generator then is able to generate some samples that are kind of dis indistinguishable from the other ones. What is the main use of GAN? Well, the more classic one was generating space starting from other spaces. Like this is an example of some things that here there is a black box gun and it is a person that does not exist. But we can do more. We can see the mobility network as monochannel images. Images are three channel matrices. We can represent a network, so a mobility, a mobility network, and therefore a adjacency matrix as an image. And so the question is are we able to understand the relationship and the latent links in the mobility network? We want Morgan to do something like that. Indeed, uh, it worked. 
we based on the architecture of something that is called deep convolutional gun with some modification, which has some functions and some other internal parameters I don't want you to bother about. Uh, but basically, we are doing the same thing. No, we are seeing a set of mobility networks representing them as matrices and then feed them to a simulator, uh, joined with some sample drawn at the beginning from a random noise and then refined and refined. How we did that? Shameless self promotion with psychic mobility. There is a Python library we are developing that is already developed and we are maintaining. And it's really good for handling geospatial data and human mobility algorithms. So basically, we take a data set of taxi and bike, our open data sets in Chicago, New York City. And uh, we uh, basically uh, took the rise, joined spatially with the tessellation of the city, and obtaining a structure like, like a flow data frame. It is how many people are moving between the tiles and transform this into a matrix that is suitable for our for algorithm. Of course, this is the core of the problem of the gas evaluation. I mean, evaluating a face is kind of simple. You look at, at a person, you say, yeah, this looks like a person. No, this looks like a dog. I don't know. Well, evaluating numbers is kind of harder. Evaluating networks is harder. Evaluating something like mobility networks that, yes, are networks, but uh, do not show the property we can expect from networks because if 50 people move from Oxford to London and 70 from London to Manchester, you can't produce anything about the people that went to, to, to London and then to Manchester. So that's all the measure basically around triangles and all this kind of stuff lose some significance. So we came up with a tailored approach. We uh, generate the three sets. The first set, there is a set of couples of pairs of network uh, over which we didn't trade model. The fake set, there is a mm, the set of couples were used by model, fake set of fake couples. And the mixed set, there is a set of uh, one real and one fake mobility network. And we uh, calculate the distribution of several metrics, like the common part of commuter or the root mean square error or the JS divergence between the weight distribution of the pairs, or some other natural metrics like the degree distribution or some centrality measure or some between the I'm not saying we did that because the reviewer asked so I'm not convinced that it makes sense. <laughs> he was a user, he or she was a user, so was round. Uh, between, before passing on, I want just to introduce you to some very well known models for human mobility analysis. There is the gravity model that you postulate that people relocate between two places with a probability that is directly proportional to their mass, where the mass can be the population or the relevance or another concept of importance that you want, and inverse in proportion to that distance. It's fun because here I forgot to put some exponents that will be the core work of, an, of the other work that I will introduce. But trust me, here there are some exponents that you should be doing. The relation model is an uh, enhancement of the gravity model. Basically, it's a region based model that assigns each location a number of opportunity O, and then each step a traveler runs the location for according to this number of opportunity and shows the nearest that or the one. If he is attracted more after the priority force, that uh, is above a certain um, thickness threshold. It has a closed formula that it has to explain something. Okay. So uh, let's go to we Morgan. What we did, we observed that uh, this is our model for New York City by taxi, Chicago by Chicago taxi, as you can see. The, uh, the distribution in this case of the normalized root mean square error is completely overlapping in our model while it's not overlapping in the, in the other. And this is a good indicator to that we are basically we are not overfitting and generating something that you already observed. And here you can see how this is a um, mobility network pixel random. This is a pixel random. Uh, generated uh, mobility network, they are pretty distinguishable. Even the gravity model is doing a kind of good job too. Uh, I, from my, I promise you that if you read the paper, you can be convinced of the uh, performance improvement of the of moment that is significant and uh, coherent with all the metrics we propose. Let's move to the 
to the second uh, part of the journey. Uh, we ask yes, but uh, what about the collateral effect of the flow? Before doing that, I want to say that this is done inside a bigger framework that we are introducing that is called social AI. Two main uh, observations about social AI uh, are the two main points is that a crowd of intelligent individuals is not necessarily an intelligent crowd. Uh, this is because the sum of uh, the individual optimal choices can be not good for the society. Why is that? Because we share the sources. As an example, we share free. So the suggestion I get from a navigation app can be beneficial maybe for me, not for everybody. We get suggestion about opinion dynamic and uh, my the suggestion can be good for my team, but can provide polarize me or my group. And we get suggestion, for example, when doing this shopping. And you can imagine that, of course, can be good for me to see some really detailed products, but can kill some other companies, for example, or other business or whatever. But what about mobility flows? Yes, we are very good in predicting and also to generate, as we see, the, so the mobility flows, but we know also that they impact our cities with the crowdedness, some places that get insanely crowded, the, the commuting process are massively affected by that. But are there some collateral effects and this, are these effects somehow driven by the navigation apps we use? We came up with Traffico 2. There is uh, an article submitted to six parts of the paper. And uh, the main goal is to assess and the impact of these navigators uh, because we, we notice a, a very, very counterintuitive idea. I mean, one can think that the more navigation, navigation apps are used in the city, the less the pollution level, but this is not true, as we will show. Specifically, we designed this framework that is based on this uh, human mobility simulator called SUMO. Uh, we construct the mobility flows of all the metrics based on real uh, on a real car data set of Milan in Italy, and we basically uh, from this uh, all the metrics we build a route of a set of routed paths. It is paths that share only the origin and the destination through drawn at random uh, from the old metrics and then uh, route this according to several navigators thanks to sumo over an actual road network and then we simulate basically what happened if you use two navigators basically the one of open street map and so on that was the one open source we, had. we were able to to leverage well we saw that when uh, about 50% of the vehicles are routed. Uh, the total CO2 emissions are reduced according to both generate to both navigators, and the uh, the CO2 exposure inequality is minimized computer as a unit. It is not a good solution if nobody or everybody gets routed. Uh, Tom Tom is fairer than of a street map, as you can see. We can expect that Tom Tom is a company that will that. Core business of the street map is our voluntary basically uh, put in suggestion. And uh, the navigator tends to pollute more the external rhythm frame of the city. Why is that? Because you, the default mm, setting is that you don't want to uh, go into that mm, low, low carbon zone, or you don't want to pay for accident. Uh, what does rooted mean here and what's the alternative? Rooted means that these mm, simulated paths follow the suggestion of the navigators. Okay, and the, the other, the other ones are uh, the two data. We don't root them, you know? Uh, okay, so it's a mix of, so like the percentage on your x axis here is basically how much data is here and how much data. Uh, what are the future works of this? This is a line of research I abandoned, but my friends Julian Cornac and it's in the college, so I'm more interested about that can answer you. Well, we are analyzing more navigation apps like Google Maps, Apple, and it's kind of hard to get the data from this company. They really don't want you to, to analyze them, but we will. Uh, we want to understand their interplay. Like here, we are assuming that only a percentage of navigators of single, of single navigator, navigators is used, but of course, 
a population can use a mixture of navigators. Uh, we plan to extend to more cities, find some universal pattern. Understanding how perturbing the suggestion in an informative way can be beneficial. Spoiler, it is. And understanding if the echo route is completely beneficial for a city. You know that Google Maps releases eco routing stuff. Spoiler, no. Uh, at this point of the presentation, you probably understood why, because yes, are eco routed uh, suggestions, but are mild eco routed suggestions. The mass effects are not necessarily the same. Do you, do you know if they suggest different books in different languages? Sorry, do you know if OpenStreetMaps or the other company, uh, whatever that was, uh, do they suggest different books in different times of day? Yeah, they, they do, but it's really hard to yeah to deal with the uh, live suggestion data source. This is, of course, another uh, future work. For now, we are working with static suggestions, so, but uh, I heard that Julian is also doing something like that. I must say that now I, I move to this to, to other topics. Uh, maybe. So the, uh, the main topic is segregation. Uh, what is segregation is defined by the European Communist Commission against racism and intolerance of the act by which a natural legal person separates other people on the basis of one of the enumerated grounds without an objective and reasonable justification. This seems uh, quite reasonable to me. Uh, it's different from integration, it's different from exclusion, is some people in a Art and some people in a role. Uh, it was first modeled by Thomas Schelling in 1971. He was the, the Shelley one who was the first agent based model of the history. It represents city as a chessboard, and uh, two races, black and white, represents the, the household that, that are found on this chessboard. Uh, one also that can occupy only one cell per time, and initially the agents are put at random on the chessboard. When Okay. Each agent has eight direct neighbors. Uh, at each time step, uh, only the dissatisfied agents are okay. The dissatisfied agents uh, are the ones who are surrounded by a number of different agents that is above a certain, certain threshold that is a parameter of the, of the model. Important, you can only rotate to a free cell when you are dissatisfied. So, main result of the Schelling model is this. It's even if we are really tolerant, uh, because we tolerate up to two thirds of our neighbors to be different than us, the city becomes segregated. Not only because they segregated, but it becomes segregated suddenly in a small number of steps. Uh, and will be segregated more than necessary, so more than the two thirds. Uh, so we can say that tolerance is not a situation. A really fast, uh, I mean, a lot of work. Have uh, been after the Shelling seminal work, uh, a lot of extension. Uh, they changed the model, uh, the agent vision and behavior, they changed the neighborhood, they changed the environmental settings, they changed the proportion of the population, they introduced some venues that mitigate the segregation at mm, physical places in the chessboard. Uh, they changed the vision of the agents. They compared the physical model, they described the segregation is a phase transition and often it's like a plastic of droplets in an oil, uh, following the same law of the AC model. Uh, it is hard to find a tipping point, even if someone claims they claim they found it. And there are some chapters. Uh, was introduced also to networks uh, and several indexes also about networks have been developed. And also, uh, someone is trying to um, understand how the, the, the way you explore a city in terms of daily mobility, not in terms of housing relocation, influences the segregation of the places. Some models try to reproduce the uh, shelling dynamics using reinforcement learning, and others use shelling concepts to. Uh, assessing the point of a political partition of, uh, of, the, of the border of a state. So one can say, yes, they are working it since 1971, maybe it's over, let's change subject. No, uh, <laughs> no, it's still uh, a great inspiration and a very active uh, uh, research topic. Uh, we are very far from understanding how this theoretical and in vitro state uh, model can can adapt to real uh, real life scenarios. Uh, we try to make a step over this, uh, understanding how uh, factor influences segregation dynamics. 
and you try to guess which factor we injected, you will never imagine. Yes, we injected them on beach. <laughs> so uh, instead of studying what is the how the mobility gets segregated, we studied how the segregated gets mobility. So uh, we try to assess the mobility impact of the segregation integration dynamics. Main claim when I relocate, I want to um, uh, to put me in the, this competition between individual and collective dynamics as published in the Jensen work. I want to avoid huge difference when I change out, it seems quite reasonable. And I want to go with opportunities. I want to go in zones that where I can somehow find something that interests me. Uh, this is a preprint we didn't publish yet. I hope we will submit it in the maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Actually, yes. So main idea, uh, an agent that is in the cell A relocates to a cell B with a probability that is a product of two power law is filed by the branch model. So um, something that is um, directly proportional to the uh, relevance of a cell times an exponent alpha. It is called single constrained gravity model because you only, con you only consider the relevance of the destination place uh, times a function of the distance mm -hmm. regulated by two exponents alpha and beta. The distance is the hidden difference, and the relevance function is a, mm, a function of the distance from the center. We put it, we put like the uh, corporate frame dynamics in which uh, the the more important cells are in the center. So the farther you get from the center, the less uh, you, you, the cell is important. And we basically muting this guy here, the alpha, we have an only distance model, muting this guy here, to have controlling, taking it to zero. We have an ordinary relevance model, taking bottom of them to zero, we have shelling model, because basically a probability is uh, Uniform and we can pick a cell at random. As you can see, uh, the jumps made by the agents in the shelling model and in the relevance model are quite normally distributed because they don't have any preferences in terms of distance from where to go. While the one in the distance model and in the say gravity model, there is a completely one are picked to our small uh, jumps. I mean, is there still a, a rule where you? Uh, if it's two thirds of uh, people you want to. Yeah, we change, we change also the parameter about the homophily. Nothing actually changed here. We kept, we, we kept yes, two thirds as a homophily parameter, but we tried also with lower and higher homophily parameters, but they're, they're, we found the same thing. Okay. So, uh, with, with, with which we we'll charge the results when we control one of the two exponents. Uh, S is the final average. We, we run a lot of experiments, of course, and uh, S is the final average of certain segregation levels, and then it's average with the time that the model required to converge. Uh, thank you, then the zoom. But <laughs> if you if you recall the exponent beta for being the classical shelling one must be negative because we want it to be on the denominator, right? Uh, so you can wonder the first thing looking to this picture why there is a positive one because once we were doing calculation and by mistake we we kept a uh, positive beta but we we thought that this would be interesting because what happens if I give more importance and more priority to cells that are far from it maybe maybe something can change actually few things change if you think that this is the classical shelling but you know what's interesting to see this is this model was nice. It would look to say, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, controlling the relevance, the more the distance impacts the dynamics, so the more beta is negative, the lowest uh, segregation level and the highest the number of steps required to converge to be observed. Uh, one can say, well, if we observe lowest segregation values and die convergence time, it means that the segregated dynamics require more to end. So it's good because I'm controlling the segregative uh, phenomenon. Not, not, not so simple as we will see. Uh, controlling the distance, we observe more or less the same phenomena, but less pronounced. 
like uh, increasing alpha, uh, decrease the lower the segregation level, and increase the conversion time. Of course, with uh, something that is more linear than this. What about the interplay? So, what about we, we don't control one of them and we let them go free to the jungle? Well, we, we see that the segregation is maximized in the only relevance model. So, here, so where the alpha gets the highest parameter and the difference has no impact, and minimized when B uh, is uh, equal, beta, sorry, is impactful despite the value of alpha, like this column here. The, the, the final segregation level observed and low, regardless of the alpha. Uh, as for the convergence time, uh, we, for being it maximized, we want both theta and alpha to be impactful here. In this zone here, we observe the highest uh, convergence time rates. And uh, it is minimized when alpha is low. Mm -hmm. Over there, so the distance has no effect in minimizing uh, convergence time. So it means that the distance is bounded in two ways with the set with the, with the convergence times. Because if it is not impactful, you can't minimize the the times. If it is in, impactful, if you increase a lot the times. So when you say convergence, what does that mean? Uh, like everybody said. Oh, everybody said, yeah. So I put this kind of sign here because it is a really freshly baked result like this morning. <laughs> but uh, the results of the interplays are hard to interpret and even hard to explain. But why is that? Because of the Jesus of disability. What happened? That when the center, we calculated the center segregation and we, we saw that it does something like that. It oscillates, no? Uh, I mean, explosive at the at the beginning and then oscillates. So we look to a snapshot of the uh, CD in that tipping point for seeing what's happening. And backtracking, we observe that the agents that are in the in the suburbia, let's say in this ring outside the center, are the ones that will stay unactive for a huge amount of time, the minority agents uh, that are in this uh, ring over there are the ones that will, will stay unactive for a huge amount of time, causing this elongation in the convergence time. So it's not that we are actually slowing down the segregation times. It's that the segregation happens anyway, emerged anyway, but these few guys are, in the case of the gravity model, of course, are attracted by the center, prefer short distance, and they can get out of the center, but the center is not meant for them because they are minority and the, and the center is taken by the majority. So if as that's wrong, they are stuck in there, they can't exit and the, the dynamics uh, keep oscillating. When it ends, when randomly you select, for example, this cell over here and uh, everybody follows you because you change the segregation level in the other zone and people are able to follow you. Uh, okay. Uh, did you work of uh, this? This work of the oh, sorry, uh, for the link thing. Um, this is this is because you don't care about the difference in the attraction uh, of the target location in your current location. That you only care about the target's locations. Right? Of course, of course. Right. Yeah. So if, if you have like a different term, this thing might work. Uh, I don't know what happened if you could see, but. But in some way, when you relocate, you are not active in your place. So for us, it's a reasonable assumption that you only check what's going on where you're going, not what you are leaving. Because you, you check, you, you leave if you are surrounded by people that you don't like mm -hmm. because are richer than you or another race than you or whatever. Shelling says segregation happens along many lines and in many ways. So 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 you leave because you don't like your neighbors. Yeah, and you you but you, you choose a location. Not by looking at your neighborhood, but by looking at how they yeah, exactly. are. So you're not looking. So it's two factors at every location. You're looking at one to decide whether you leave and one yeah. to decide. Yeah, yeah exactly. Decide whether exactly. One is for neighborhood and one is for vision. The right. vision is what you're looking for mm -hmm. and is influenced by distance and by relevance. The neighborhood is what you have. Yeah. Ah, uh, these uh, results are statistically significant because it is the proportion uh, of all the um, suburban agents, the one that. Mm, 
found themselves in the uh, oh, sorry, all the outlier regions like the one that backtracking caused this elongation. The percentage of them that found themselves into the ring when the when the clock rang and this like this is the average of, across a lot of uh, like one thousand experiments and this is the standard deviation you can see that is significantly higher than our random model one. Uh, as we do work, of course, we are aware that different and opportunities are not the only drivers of location. Uh, the next thing to try would be which is the impact of an underlying social network. Like I want to move also according to my social network that represents maybe the the knowledge I have in other places of the city or the ease of displacement because making a relocation can be hard and I want to consider it too. Otherwise, we can assign to each other not to each other the personal mobility networks that wait its vision of the city, like waiting more where it works or where we have fun. Uh, if we don't save it, we can we are able to generate it with the interesting world space called Morgan. I don't know if <laughs> Okay, uh, last things like uh, are these flows uh, producing some inequalities in the city? That is, aka, what am I doing in Oxford? Fast answer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, we, we know that this relocation, you know, this close up relocation in the city happens more and more. People are changing out more and more. Nobody has more any, any more up property house. Uh, and this, of course, shapes the, the evolution of the city. Uh, can have some positive aspects, right? Some, some can get requalified, and some ne negative aspects will be interesting uh, to understand which. If segregation is a picture of a city, meaning that in some moment they can go into a neighborhood and understand if it is segregated or not, because in an ideal world, I count how many rich and poor are in each neighborhood and I know if it is segregated. I can do it with the phenomena that is called gentrification. You probably heard about it. I'm going to increase it in the next slide because I don't have the full idea of what went on before. I don't know what's the history of it. The question is, are we able to use a temporal network framework to model it? So what's gentrification? There is no standard definition of segregation. Curious case, this guy, I don't know if you ever heard the city, <laughs> defined the process as the improving of an area of a town or a city so that it attracts people of higher social class than before. Please pay attention to the word improving. Cambridge Dictionary, I don't know if you ever heard about this rivalry. Uh, define it as the process by which a place, especially part of a city, changed from being a poor area to a rich one, where people from an social class live. So, giving a more social uh, interpretation to that. I don't know. I must say, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, what is it? Uh, the navigation doesn't know what it is. It only, it, it only knows what it is and like about. Uh, it was first introduced by Neil Smith in 1987 as uh, this phenomenon of changing of a neighborhood that changes such economic characteristics, let's say. Uh, they, I mean, a part of the regulator evidence that we highlighted out was uh, not only an economic but a chaotic nature, so something that is worth studying with a physical approach. And the main driver is the range gap, like the difference between the actual and potential range of a property, like what's the value of my property now and what can be the value of my property if the area, uh, of course, uh, improve somehow. You can understand that it's really hard to quantify that because you don't know, uh, you can't know the future, basically. And also, I'm not saying that only regressive models maybe are being made or prediction model, like trying to understand some feature of this, maybe geographical feature, and try to predict what will go on. Uh, this is our hypothesis, like in a shelling framework, let's say with uh, this is easy representation of the city. Like initially, we can imagine that the inhabitants are displaced at random, then they get segregated. Do they get segregated? Yes. 
of CT SAR segregated. At the time M, we can imagine as the next step for a desegregation, hard, but we can still try to imagine too. Or we can observe a gentrification because some neighborhoods will be less valuable than the others, and someone will want to speculate over there. Uh, the there is a lack of common definition. There are no laws and patterns extracted, and uh, the words are mainly the classical APM with, with classical agent based model. Like I, I mean, this huge agent based model that takes into account a lot of variable, like the number of the average square foot of the houses or the number of uh, Airbnb listings or whatever that, of course, are useful for understanding a single city uh, situation, are not useful if you want to generate. Uh, to generalize and understand how these dynamics extend to a universal pattern. Uh, we, before starting, we made two hypotheses. One week, a weaker one that segregated neighborhood, of course, socioeconomic segregated neighborhood, are the ones that are more likely to be gentrified. And that's from why one that is the main driver of the world gentrification phenomenon is the is this economic inequality. It is these guys here, the Airbnb or the hotels and the restaurants are, are only a byproduct of the main factor that is the economic inequality. So we came up with a very, very temptative uh, schema of model. We hypothesized the uh, inhabitants of a city to be divided in three classes the low income one, the middle income up one, and the high income one. Of course, as you can imagine, the, the the well distribution of the high income one follows like a Pareto distribution or a power law. So the rich are way, way, way richer than the poor. And the middle income margin takes all the almost all the spectrum of values and moves between them. Uh, so the main difference are the main difference is the uh, division of these judges. The poorer you are, the less you see the network. So uh, we hypothesize this hierarchical structure of communities and of nodes, like a node or a low level community, if you want, uh, can be uh, populated by agents of different kinds. Mm. The full one only see this level, so their nodes or belonging that can be a spatial, a fertile or spatial ventilation or a habitat unit or whatever. And they relocate if they are poorer, so if they can't afford anymore to stay there. Where do they relocate? Well, they relocate to one of their neighbor nodes because they only know this part of the city where, of course, they are not in the same situation. Even if shelling dynamics suggest that even if you relocate at random, this shouldn't be uh, a huge difference in terms of what emerge, but should be a difference only in terms of convergence time. But still. Let's see what happens. We don't know because we didn't, we didn't simulate it yet. The middle income, income margins is that uh, you have the vision of the community. So an uh, hierarchical organization, and they know what's going on. They still evaluate the situation, not in their nodes, but in their community. And if they uh, are poorer in this community, they want to improve and they want to grow in a community in which they were, they will, will be poor. Sorry, if they are richer, they want to go to a community where they are poor. Like, I want to improve my situation. I want to go with someone that is mm, socioeconomically higher in a higher situation. Of course, we consider the cost of selling the house. Uh, that is the value you have in this community. And the opposite way, to, the opposite way around. If they feel poor, they want to go in a place where they can be rich because they can anymore. Uh, the interesting aspect are the high income majors. Uh, they are a very minority of the, the population, and they are the only one that have access to the temporal aspect. Not only they can see all the network, but they also remember what's going on. So basically, they evaluate what, what these guys are doing. Like, are you starting to Improving a neighborhood, so this neighborhood shows a uh, rate of, uh, an interesting rate of change. Let's say I will go there, I will gentrify that. This means that if I go there, the level of socioeconomic, average socioeconomic level increases and the dynamics can continue. Of course, 
this is uh, never ending dynamic, but it is not, not a problem. There are a kind of much played model that in which you are interested in understanding the patterns and the temporal patterns. So we are we are okay with that. Uh, in a nutshell, gentrification is a complex mechanism that can be and needs to be represented by a local emitter of the for doing something like shelling this, like understanding which are the core drivers and uh, simulate them. Uh, can be seen as a dynamic on a network with a hierarchical community structure, and the sociopromity status is an indicator of the order vision of the network of the agent, higher or lower. And uh, uh, we want to focus on the mobility based on the low income guys. I mean, yes, maybe you are improving the neighbor, but where do you where do you see so? And perform it for the label well, uh, As a work line, I would like to write more because I'm finishing not uh, uh, an easy task. And uh, we want to introduce a temporal network based indicator for each neighborhood. Of course, we want this indicator to keep into account of the evolution of the community plan for quantifying its gentrifying level. And uh, of course, must be proportional to the difference between the poor guys that go out and the middle guys that uh, arise at defining the gentrification as a temporal pattern, as you say. We want to test it on a real world data set, like how can we do that? We can measure gentrification with other classical um, measures. <laughs> And uh, for example, considering the average number of Airbnb or average number of restaurants or whatever, and see if you observe the same growing rate or decreasing rate of our social economic measures. And maybe test it on our location data that for seeing if our findings are confirmed, admitting that some location data exists. That was used to Thank you for the attention. I got some room. Yeah, I'm saying yeah, we want to really great. Um, I'm wondering about in the the study you talked about, I guess mostly in the beginning, where you have real data mobility networks. Um, how what is the spatial resolution you're usually looking at when you're constructing these mobility networks? I imagine it changes from data set to data set, and I, I'm wondering specifically about self loops uh, and how they come into play. Uh, okay. For these kinds of things, because if your if your data set is granular enough, you probably don't have to worry. It just means somebody maybe moved across the block, and it's just noise. But if they're big, then actually self loops might be important. And so I'm curious whether they were part of the modeling in that table. Yeah, thank you for your question. Actually, you uh, you spotted the crucial point of the work I didn't mention. And is that if you see over there this number 54 mm -hmm. is not random. The problem is that these convolutional guns only work, I mean, they converge, it's only proof for 64 by 64 uh, matrices. So we split the area in a tessellation of uh, resulting in a 64 division of the space. So it changed by city. So depending on the city, it's yeah, true. of course, but for New York, we did over Manhattan, not over the whole New York City because mm -hmm. it was kind of a problem. For Chicago, we took the loop neighborhood and uh, after this side, maybe I don't remember. So, we have more like the, the central zone of the city. And so, this one's the first question that we aggregated close. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question was the self loops. Well, we don't have problem in the self loops because you just count how many trips started and ended in the same time. Of course, gravity is not able to generate self loops because we'll be at zero in the next one, in the terminator point. What can we do? <laughs> <laughs> it's not able, our mother is better. It's one of the ways it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, of course, as I said, it doesn't. It is not meant for solving exactly the mobility network generation. So it's a flow that in the original formulation didn't appear of the gravity mm -hmm. yeah. If you're comparing your justification model to like real world data sets, how would you account for or like remove the effects of racial like segregation that you might have happened to your team? Yeah, uh thank you. <laughs> I mean. Uh, in our hypothesis, what drives it is the socioeconomic uh, difference. So our race 
and your is your only category. Uh, we did as racial segregation, we are not including it yet, but we think that in some cases it can be a good proxy also the city to the state uh, organization. But it would be interesting to find something similar only considering not the such a proxy status, but the rational status group or injecting it. And we are still doing it, so maybe it would be good. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that Mogan sort of comes from Mogan to um, create images. Yeah. Um, and of course, both of them are ideal in the community. But I'm wondering if there's something we know about um, mobility latency that is, say, like something like a conservation of some kind, you know, roughly uh, same number of people leave. Yeah. 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 Is that information that you can incorporate? Because that's not true of images. No, 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 no. no. So, are we, is that a way to incorporate this additional knowledge that we have by knowing that this is mobility tracing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, of course, it is. It's called conditional grants. I mean, grants where you pass an array that controls the other information to be to the grant, but to the grant. But we wanted to get to keep it as agnostic as possible. Like, we wanted to understand if it is. If it was learning the main model of the mobility, the gravity and the radiation, like the fact that people relocate to other opportunities and people relocate near for the daily mobility specifically, so that we compare with this as baseline. But we didn't, we we, we wanted to be as um, parameter free as possible. Like uh, you figure it out, you are an artificial agent model, you have to figure it out. I don't want to tell you this because I want you to be able to generalize. For we did we chose to do the same thing, for example, for the day of the weeks. Like we didn't say it is a weekly network of a Sunday or of a Christmas afternoon. I want you to be able to give me something that um, can generate fake mobility networks. And I am the police makers and I, I don't know what's going on. I see okay, this is admit admissible, like I can plan something over that, even without knowing which day it is. For understanding, for example, if your city is able to resist the shocks, for example, you want something that is acceptable, but you don't want to know what happened, you just want to know that it is there. Right. But it would be, would it be I mean, uh, useful for your for you to be able to tell your gang that hey, okay, I want more great cases for a Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that Sunday yeah. is very different. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Actually, was uh, uh, is a way of expanding our work. But for this third formulation, we want something that was as uh, easy as possible in terms of information. Right. And I also have one more sort of thing about the newer stuff that you're doing. The yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the gentrification. Um, so the model says that low-income um, agents have less. Visibility than high income. Visibility. Yeah, right. Um, does that also restrict how far they can move? Yeah. Uh, and is that something that comes from data, or is that like a stylized fact that is known in social economics or something? Yeah, exactly. It's the same. Mm -hmm. if, if that were a stamp, something we would like to check. In yeah. The data. Okay. Well, well. But is it is it like in 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 say not in maybe in mathematical modeling literature, maybe in the sociology literature, is it something that's known? That yes, low income people have yeah. lower movement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like in the daily mobility is known, in the relocation mobility is not known because yeah, there are no relocation data. <laughs> I mean, like it's really hard to convince yeah, uh, a city to give you the relocation data. I, I, <laughs> I swear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and so nonetheless, I mean, you know, still we're at the very beginning of it, we just this should be kind of like the first formation of yeah. what kind of are to some extent if we do eventually have some kind of data, <clears throat> there is also a need to be able to for the model to some extent. So so the smallest, like the least income agents can only move sort of to neighboring nodes. Yeah, I mean to neighbor to know to which they are connected. The right. middle income ones moves in the, the same community. They can move anywhere within their community. But they can't exist. No, sorry. Well, they, 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 are, they are like the one along the border, the, the boundary. Of the yeah, these are the good ones. So well, the middle is good ones change community, but evaluate their, their community, not their nodes. So um, and okay. move in another community. The rich ones see what's going on in each community and decide 
where to let the data come in. Oh, are there any more questions? Are there any questions online? I don't yeah. think so. I think I'm in the chat. Yeah, no, but I think those are mine. No, I'm just like, everything has gone wrong. I'm <laughs> sorry. Apologies. It was the wrong mouse. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then let's thank Giovanni again. Um, I think we need to work from all. Yeah, make a nice time you with us. Let's see. Session. Okay. Well, thank you all online for attending this. Thank you all here, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Bye.